Hello and a warm welcome to the Racing Postcast, brought to you by Racing Post Members Club. My name's Sam Hart, in the hosting chair this week for a, what's going to be an action-packed weekend of racing. We've got Ascot to get through Newmarket and also Red Car. We head there for the two-year-old trophy. And guess what? I've brought back the flat pack. Those who are Racing Post YouTube viewers and have been for many years or the last couple of years will know what I mean by that. But the flat pack is back. I've got Keith Melrose and Matt Gardner on. Matt, it's the first time you've actually been on the show, so I'll come to you first. How are things? And I, I mean, what do you think of this weekend's racing? And what did you think of last weekend's racing? Yeah, good thanks, mate. Yeah, uh, last week's brilliant, isn't it? Art weekend's always a, a cracker, just race after race of, of proper quality stuff in it. Um, this weekend's a, a, a little different, not quite so good, but properly competitive stuff kind of everywhere you look, really. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. The final few weeks of the, the British Flat Season Champions Day, only a few weeks away. Uh, Keith, what did you make of the Arc winner Ace Impact? He was exceptional, wasn't he? Yeah, Ace Impact was fantastic, wasn't he? I mean, it was a race to suit him. Um, you know, we talked about his stamina, but it was another crawl around and quicken, and that's what he'd done in all his previous races, and he did again. And I'm not certain that it was the very best art behind, but he was exceptional, wasn't he? Uh, it does make me miss Equinox a little bit. We talk about those two meeting up. I think that was the day, wasn't it? That was the day it should have happened. We never saw it, but it was it was great to see a proper champion in the, in the arc. You know, I'm going to be perfectly frank. Had Westover won that arc, I'd have been a bit flat. Because that's a sort, you know, Westover, admirable though he is, you know, you've got slightly higher designs for the arc than that. But uh, Ace Impact was a properly good winner, wasn't he? He really was, and I'd love to see if he could stay in training next season um, and see what he can do next year. Those who are watching on YouTube, as always, remember to like, subscribe, get your comments in down below. And those who are listening to us on all audio platforms, don't forget to share the podcast if you are enjoying them. Let's kick off then in the first part. We start off with Ascot Racecourse. We've got four races to get through here. And we start off with the 150, which is the five furlong Blue Eagle Rue Stakes, the listed contest where Emiratiana tops the market at 9-4, to four. Corker 4-1, four to one. Nymphadora 11 to 2, Rage of Bambi 13 to 2, Designer 12 to 1, 16 to 1 about Chipstead and Zudu Spirit, 33 to 1, Glamorous Breeze and Rum Cocktail, the outside the lot at 40 to 1. Keith, I'll come to you first here because Nymphadora was actually napped up by yourself last time I was on the, the postcast with you and was desperately unlucky. I thought at one stage Nymphadora would just keep battling all the way to the line, but look, a fair price again here, but taking on maybe slightly tougher rivals. Possibly so, although I definitely think uh, she's going to be suited by a stiffer test at the trip. I watched the Newbury race uh, and thought, you know what, she's, if she's getting another chance, it's at a really stiff track over five. And now she turns up at Ascot, so you know can't complain with that. It's exactly the sort of track I'd give her one more chance at. The, our forceful tactics, uh, the one place you get away with that at Ascot is over the five fun long track, and historically speaking. Emirati Yana's in a state of managed decline, quite honestly. He'd been, you know, he'd group one winner in his time, but would have been uh, packed off to stud by now if, if he wasn't a gelding, I think. Corker, that Beverly race fell apart for him a little bit, and he's never been a horse that I would uh, have my last on, it's more than fair to say. And the rest, she's better than the rest, I would say, on, on the balance of recent form. So Nymphadora, I think, is one, worth one more chance. Yeah, I think Nymphadora is worth one more chance in here as well. Jason Watson taking the ride. What did you make of this one, Matt? I mean, it's a. Uh... It's not the best quality contest, but there is some fair prices in here. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement. I think we're all on the, the Nymphadora train. She's, um, I mean, you look at her profile, a, a very brief look at her profile, you'd think she was quite speedy. You know, she's won two at York and one at Chester, I think, but she was second in that Palace of Holyrood House race last year. And, I mean, the the, key, the point that Keith makes about the five furlong at, at Ascot is true in the sense that if you are a front runner, it's kind of your best chance on the straight course. Six plus, yeah, it, it's much more difficult. Um, I, I think Emirati Anna was looking long in the tooth on his last couple of starts. He had absolutely every chance at Newmarket and York and, and couldn't get the job done in a race that he sh he'd, he'd have won last year, really. Um, so I can't have him. And yeah, I, I, I really like Nymphadora as well. A joint selection to kick off this week's postcast. Nymphadora at 11 to 2 in the 150. Let's move on to the 225 then. The one, and a, uh, one mile and a half Jim Barry Cumberland Lodge Stakes. This is a group three contest where Shabwell Estate send two here and they're both at the top of the market. Al RC 13 to 8 and Isra 4 to 1. Al Kareem 9 to 2. Claymore and Postilio 10 to 1. 14 to 1. Lastronome 14 to 25 to 1. And Yukon Glen 33 to 1. Matt. 
Jim Crowley would most likely have had the choice here. He'd probably gone for the obvious one in our RC. Has he picked the right one? This is a very al sort of race, isn't it? Like, he's won quite a lot of races. Most of them have been smallish fields in kind of minor pattern company. Um, he's also really prone to spitting the dummy out. His profile, you know, he, he can bomb out. He's looked sort of pretty quirky a couple of times. Um, he wasn't seen to best effect in Ireland last time, but if you're getting beat by Adelaide River, who's not a star by any means, then... You know, you're not exactly looking to steam in at sort of six to four. I don't think in in this sort of race. Um, I haven't been blown away by Israel to be honest. Um, the Ascot kind of round course, you, you you've really got to be in the right place at the right time. And the one that looks like he might be for me is Al Karim. Um, he looks better than ever really when he won at Chester last time. And um, he's a really straightforward, likable kind of game horse. Um, he's got the exact sort of style that you want. He might get a soft lead here. There's not that many kind of sort of pace options against him. So I don't really fancy either al or Israel, to be honest. And um, yeah, al Karim was, was the one that sort of jumped out for me. Yeah, al Karim bounced back to form last time out. Keith, I was uh, reading my emails early in the week and Robbie Wilders in his anti-post column put up both al and Israel. I think 3-1 to one about al and 6-1 to one Israel. He looks like he's on some nice prices here. Yeah, he often is. Uh, he does genuinely think like an anti-post punter does, Robbie. You know, and he's he's had a nice result uh, last week. He had Ghost Rider and the anti-postman column at ten to one, who came in and, and won the Royal Lodge. So he does get some good results in there. Um, you know, and they're the right sort of bets to have at that stage because you knew if those horses were declared, you'd be looking at you know you'd be looking at these sort of prices when they when they turned up. Uh, they're not inspiring me at the current prices. They're the sort of horses that. You know, if you're betting enough of these races, you you end up getting your fingers burnt by horses like Isra and Al Asi quite a lot. So I was looking beyond them. Al Karim I also respected quite a lot. I can't argue with putting him up at all because I'm not even probably going to bet in this race. I would be interested to see the vibes for Claymore, who's got the really good course form. He had the run of the race. I mean, Adam Kirby took the mick out of the Tory eh, when he won the Hampton Court last year, but it's been a bit of a struggle since he bled last time when he ran in the, the Brigadier Gerard. But if the vibes were good, double figures in a race like this is tempting. But I'd, I'd be waiting for vibes and I'm not hugely confident anyway. But my main message here is feel free to get after that for that top two. Right, OK, there we go. Yeah, race to, to be a little bit wary of there for Keith. We'll move on to the three o'clock then, which is the John Guest Racing Bengal Stakes, which is a six furlong contest, a group three where Comanche Falls tops the market 130, Anaf is 5 to 1, Garris 13 to 2, Dark Trooper is 7 to 1, along with 1 Le Pan and 12 to 1 bar these. Keith, you to go first here, who do you like? Um, a lot of old faces that we'll, we'll all know, and Comanche Falls, very likable animal, and Anaf's done so well winning that Portland and everything, but there's a horse here that I thought after his last race, I said, this is probably when the Ben Goff this, and that's Dark Trooper, who. Look, he's got loads of ones beside his name and sort of horses I would tend to be against normally, but this horse has just looked miles ahead of his mark every time. He won a, a racing league race, you know, he's won a Sunday series race, he won a Shergar Cup race, you know, those are all warm handicaps on your way up to win on your way up. And then last time he's won off a mark of, of 97 here, beating Redemption Time. It was a pretty strong race, the third uh, is Bacento who ran a really good race in what's a, what looks a really strong not so 85 at Newmarket last week to me. Dark Trooper won that race by half a length going away, very much ready for a, a, a shot at group company. Now, he's been winning over six at Ascot, so the Bengoff made sense. He just looks like a horse that's come peaking at the right time, whereas, you know, likeable as Comanche Falls, Anaf and Garas all are. Are they peaking at the right time? I'm not so sure. And Dark Trooper is just a much more attractive horse for me. Okay, Dark Troop 7 1 in the bank off stakes for Keith. Matt, who do you like in this one? Yeah, looking at it in a, in, in a very similar way, to be honest. Like, say, Anaf Comanche Falls, he form horses. Dark Troop is the, the rapidly progressive one stepping up from handicaps. He's got sort of six, seven pounds to find with those, but I think you'd be hard pushed to watch his last race and think that he couldn't find that. Um, the, the, the race that he won last time was, was kind of like counter Ascot in the sense that they didn't go that hard for a sprint and it was really hard to make up ground. He was the only one that did so. I think the second, third and maybe the fourth as well were all ridden more prominently. Um, you know, he does have to take that step forward, but he's been one of the most progressive sprinters around this summer and um, yeah, I think he's going to be more than capable of it. The other thing about that Ascot run was, I think it was the second time in a row at Ascot that he's had to go entirely around the field. He started off from quite a low stall in that race, and the time before he was in a high stall ended up in the middle of the track. This time he was a low stall, ended up right on the rail. You know, he's winning these races, 
he's he's mugging them off. He's not just winning them. In terms of that race, though, can I just make a, a point about Comanche Falls, who everyone seems to think he's a course specialist, obviously, at York. What is it about this horse that, that you, you're concerned about here? I'm not concerned. He just, he just, he's asked up an awful lot, and he's always going as fast as he can, that horse. You know, he's, he's really genuine. But, well, you mentioned a flat back at the top. One of Ross Spryley's big things about Ascot was you've got to travel. And Comanche Falls, you know, he's won two Stewart's Cups, but he's he's just not a horse that travels through races. He's a horse that he's hard at it after two furlongs, but God, he keeps finding, you know, and he's such a likable horse. I just, yeah, he's he's been asked up an awful lot this season. He's been going all year, and just at those prices, it doesn't the prices arguably don't re- reflect his form chance. Uh, they reflect the fact he's so reliable. But yeah. there's horses that could be better than him on the day. There we go. Okay, yeah, no, I completely get that. Let's move on then to a really competitive race, well, it always is, the 335, which is the Howden Challenge Cup, which is a seven furlong contest. Baradar and Popmaster top market is 6-1. to one. Fresh is 7-1. to one. The lovable Quinnor is 8-1. to one. Biggles, 14-1. to one. Hickory, 14-1. to 16-1. Bar these, I was lucky enough to to go to Stuart Williams' yard on Newmarket Open weekend and have a chat to him about Quinault and just I asked him where the ceiling is with this horse and they really have no idea. I mean, he holds a really spectacular entry in the Champion Sprint at Ascot um, in three weeks' time. He's, he's probably not that good. He, he isn't that good, but they don't know where the ceiling is, Matt. And you know, eight to one might again be a fair prize about a horse who just loves winning. Yeah, absolutely. The the thing that I, that's most impressed me with Quinault this year, I mean, he's got bags of speed, but he's so game as well, isn't he, in front? There's mm. been two or three races where a furlong out, you think he's beat it, but he's, I think it was York in particular, where he really just put his head down and, and battled. Um, yeah, properly likeable, and you wouldn't put it past him to, to, to go and do it again by any means. Yeah, and who, who would be the, the main selection here for yourself? Well, I mean, you look at a race like this, and you almost feel a bit daft for having a pretty strong view of one, but, but Orban is a horse who... I just don't think he's had any luck so far this year. I mean, last year he had a cracking summer. He won that Golden Mile at, at Goodwood and he followed up over this course and distance. Um, his form figures aren't particularly flattering this summer, but he's just in much better form than that, particularly at York last time where you had to be on the pace. He was best of those that came from miles back. Um, this sort of setup's really going to suit him. His mark's more than gettable. Um, the track's going to be much more in his favour than, than than York and arguably a couple of other ones that he's run out this summer as well. So, um, you know, it is tough, but um, he's ahead of his mark and he's going to be a decent price because of those form figures. Yeah, yeah, David O'Mara in really good form as well, 20 to 1 about Orban at this current moment in time. Keith, a, a double figure price for you in here? Yeah, I thought I wouldn't, you know, I was safe with this one, but I also quite fancy Ooh. Orban. Um, is so much he's only I think he's off the same sort of mark from which he won that golden mile last year this year he was declared for this race he didn't run he got pulled out on the day uh, and then he went and ran in the bar model instead on champions day and he finished uh, what he was two length fourth or something uh, behind Chalier off a mark 10 pound higher than he's got here things just haven't been going right for him you know he ran in the golden mile again and he's he's already that was six what eight weeks ago and he's dropped another six pounds in the weight since for not running terribly. You know, there's been a couple of blobs in there. He's running in big fields. It's going to happen. But I thought the run at York last time behind Aphelios was uh, was a sign that he's still got a bit of fight in him, and he's got stacks of form better than a than a BHA mark of ninety. And um, this is a funny old meeting in that it's a rare one when odds are you want to sort of be more towards that far side than the near side they do sort of make the track quite thin at Ascot for this meeting and you find a lot more races sort of play out on that far side he's in seven and a lot of the sort of fancied ones are a little bit further across so uh, yeah or I, I, I'm not as strong as Matt I don't think but when I looked down this race I thought that Orban's too big at 20s Okay, Orban 20 to 1. I'll certainly be having a few quid on that this weekend. So there's all the uh, action we're going to be covering from Ascot. We have got an excellent members club offer on at the moment. 50% off your first three months using the code WELCOME2023. And here's what you can get. Welcome back to the Racing Postcast. Sam Hart, Keith Melrose and Matt Gardner taking you through the weekend action. 
We start off with the 130 at Newmarket then. This is a 10 furlong British EBF Premier Phillies Handicap Class 2 event here where Whispering Words is the 5-2 favourite. And then we've got a big gap back to Rad Danielle at 13-2. to two. Topness is 17-2. to two. Morning Poem and Queen Regent 10-1. to one. Lady Bobo is 12-1 to one. 14s bar these. Matt, I'll start with you here. What are your thoughts on this good Olfin favourite? So my main thought was that she was really, really short considering form and, and, and sort of potential of it as well. I mean, I know she's an unexposed Appleby horse um, that might have bumped into a decent Gosden one last time, given that they came about eight lengths clear of the rest. But she's going to have to improve the best part of a stone to defy a mark of 89. Um, and she doesn't look like she's got that sort of profile to me. Um, the, the, the one that stood out a little bit was Totnes, um, who she started out from a pretty ordinary base in handicaps, but she's just improved in chunks this year. Um, I thought she said it really well at Newbury last time, beaten by a Beckett horse who the conditions that day were probably absolutely ideal for him. And, and she met a bit of trouble and didn't get going until it was a bit too late. So I think a mark of low 90s for her is is, is still gettable. And um, yeah, I'd be I'd be pretty keen to take on that Godolphin fab. Okay, yeah, the money's been coming for Tottenham. It's 12 to 1 in 17 to 2 at the time of recording. Keith, what did you make of this handicap? It was the sort of race where you could find a horse that improves half a stone and it finishes third because you've got so many unexposed types. Whispering Words has that potential. I agree with Matt that the price isn't great at all because, yeah, there's so much, so many others in the field that, that have similar room to improve and, and the handicappers take a few chances because they finished so clear with, with the Gosden horse last time. I just wanted to put in a word for one that I think is too big a price uh, that fits into the sort of very unexposed category, and that's Lady Boba for Rafe Beckett now. This horse ran over a mile and a half last time. I think it's because the horse ran over a mile and a half at Foss last last time that it's sort of forgotten about in the betting. There's no reason Beckett can't bring a horse along as as well as uh, as Yoga Dolphin and Varian Yard and all that. He's shown how many times the horses that improve first time that we go into handicaps. They crawled round that day. Still, this horse was very a comfortable winner uh, in that race at Foss last. And, you know, people are maybe going to look and go, oh, look the Vega and, uh, you know, still relatively fast ground. It's going to be quite fast ground at Newmarket. It was fast last week. And we've had about six mil of rain. Am I, is that my right in thinking that? So it's yeah. not going to be slow unless they've watered and not told anybody. So uh, going to be quite fast ground. But actually, a lot of our uh, siblings on the dam side, a lot of our relatives on the dam side were fast ground horses. I'm sure she's got two full sisters currently running on turf in America. You know, and the ground over there tends to be pretty fast. So I'm not worried about the ground for her, even though she's got form over a mile and a half on soft at Foss last. I think that form is being held as a black mark against her when it needn't be. Uh, when at 12 to 1, she should be probably in mere 6, 7 to 1 shots. OK, Lady Boba, 12 to 1 for the, the very inform, always inform this season, Rafe Beckett yard. For the 205, which is the 6 furlong, £150,000 Tattersall's October auction stakes. This is a two-year-old contest where Zulu Chief tops the market at even money. Wood, who, Wood Hay Wonder is 9-2. to two. Grey Grey is 11-1. to one. Beanham is 14-1, to one, along with Midnight Runner. 16-1 to one, about Drama and Invincible Aura. 18s bar these. Now, Key Zulu Chief was in that really hot uh, nursery handicap at York. Really hot. I mean, everything seems to be coming out and winning from that race. Big ride for Gina Mangan on Saturday here. Even money, too short, or the right price? Um, so I mean, this, in a race like this, I just any race that's got a field like this, you know, twenty-two runners and whatever, is and you've got an even money shot. I'm trying to get them beat. I totally respect the chance. You know, that York form is really strong. Big field experience that you can't really get beat. You know, you're running the Coventry as well, didn't you? So, horse that's got loads of sort of relevant form and and should be tough enough for this sort of test. But it's one of those. It's a it's a respectful leave, uh, even money, uh, really. Uh, it's to be honest, we've got two juvenile races coming up. Matt is the two year old handicapper at the art at the Racing Post, and to be honest, we were sat in a pub discussing the racing or having a bet on the Saturday racing. First thing I do when I was looking at this race, I'd say to Matt, "What's winning this, Matt?" So I'll defer to him on this one, but I did have a little look through them all, and I was I did pick out a horse that's got absolutely no chance of the figures as it happens. So I'm quite confident Matt won't sort of mention it up. But I was quite taken by how Midnight Runner won at Thursk the other time. I mean, the the ratings don't come out that great, but he was clearly uh, better than that, including still learning the game too. And the form read relatively well for you know a sort of northern being the right sort of yards were in there. 
Uh, it looks like a horse that's got a lot more to come. Michael Dodds wouldn't rush a horse if he didn't feel the need to. Uh, and I thought 14s was quite a big price. But as I say, I'd, I'd definitely listen to Matt's opinion on this one over mine. Right, midnight round of 14 to 1. So us three are all sat in the pub, about to watch this race. Keith gives his opinion. I look over at Matt, and Matt gives a, a rise smile after Keith mentions Midnight Runner, which which obviously means there's going to be a little bit of a case made here, Matt. Is that right? Yeah, it, it, he's the one, like, uh, out of all of them. I mean, like Keith says, he, he's got no chance on the figures, but all of them, apart from Zulu Chief, don't have any chance on the figures. You know, like, it's it's these sales races are so, like, yeah, they're so stacked in, in, in an opposite way to the handicaps that you get so used to looking at. You know, the, 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 the conditions of the race mean that you often have one that just stands out a mile, and, and Zulu Chief is that this time. Um, I haven't really got a niggle against him other than the fact that his three wins have been on flat tracks, and this is going to be a little different for him. Um, like Keith said with Midnight Runner, I was impressed with him at first. Um, he, he won despite very clearly still learning on the job. Um, he was pretty keen. Um, ultimately won readily. The form's not terrible, like, like you say, for, for that sort of race. Um, the, the fact of it is, if he's going to beat an on-form Zulu Chief, he's got to improve about £20, um, which in the normal realms of a two-year-old like this, you wouldn't be anticipating him doing. Um, but if you are looking for one at a price, then yeah, I was impressed with him last time. I think he's got quite a bit more to come. Um, and going back sprinting again, I think he's, he's going to suit him. He, the way he went through that first race suggested he'd be a, he'd be a sprinter. Um, pedigree sort of backs that up as well so uh, yeah he'd, he'd be the one at a price I'd look towards. Okay Midnight Runner here, 14 to 1, seems like there's a, some nice joint selections here for uh, potentially an each way lucky 15 by the end of this postcast. Um, promise we didn't confer I absolutely promise we didn't confer beforehand <laughs> That's on, <laughs> don't worry about that The big race from Newmarket on Saturday is the 315 which is the Virgin Bet Sun Chariot Stakes, a group 1 contest over a mile where in spiral She's back under the Tory, even money favourite. Mr. Savine, the French Raider, is 4 to 1. Meditate, 17 to 2. Heredia is 10 to 1. Copies is 12 to 1. 22 to 1. Random Harvest. Goldana, 25 to 1. And Roman Mist is 33 to 1. Cheveley Park versus Baron Edouard de Rothschild, the two owners, going back to 2015 when this race was, well, when it was run, was between two great horses, an integral. And Esso Tariq in the same colours. Andre Favre trained Esso Tariq um, and Integral, obviously, in the Cheveley Park colours. We, we could see the same again on Saturday, Keith. Andre Favre sending one over. He knows how to win the race. It does, and he targets what's traditionally quite a weak group one mm. for Phillies. There's not an equivalent race in France, so he, he sees the opportunity and tends to take it. I'm quite happy to see. I think it's Marquis de Savine. I think that's a shot because it might have, might have burst the 18 characters if I put in the full <laughs> word of Marquis. Oh, was that it? Was uh, it? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what it is. I should know uh, my French Famous, room. famous writer, I believe. Oh, right. The cup in early week. But anyway, um, yeah, I'll be putting her up against in Spiral because I can rely on her. That's the main thing. In Spiral, she's a great horse and she's been a really good horse over the the piece, but I can't rely on her. I often get her wrong. Maybe that's what I'm actually saying. Mm. Uh, you know, she throws in, she's prone to throw in a stinker, and this Marcus de Safine just keeps delivering. She keeps, you know, she has been running over slightly further most of the time, but these are the sort of French races where what's most important isn't so much the distance, it's settling and quickening, and she's been showing the ability to do that. You know, it's been won by narrow margins because that's how those races play out. And she's been beating the right horses. It's more than entitled her to have a go at in Spiral. And, you know, it's it's a sort of race with, with eight runners and the horse. You'd be putting up the second as an each-way bet anyway. But especially when you've got a favourite that is the absolute antithesis of your place spotter's friend in Integral, eh, in Spiral, sorry. You, Marcus de Savine just makes sense as a bet for me. I agree. Marcus de Savine, I think this is an excellent bet. Two from two, Alexis Pouchan is uh, on this horse. And, yeah, like you said, this horse just keeps on improving run from run. Look at the horse's RPRs. And I don't think we've seen the the full potential of this horse yet. I think she's still rising up. And and like Keith says, Matt, in Spiral does throw in that odd bad run. She's run an absolute stormer out in Deauville. Is it time for her to throw in a bad one? Yeah, it could it could well be, couldn't it? I mean, we know we know very much where we are with her, don't we? In that she's a really good filly. Um, she's capable of beating or at least pushing some of the better colts. And and she has been a real force against her own sex, but whether she's like even money versus what's the 
French, she's like seven to two, four to one, four something to one, like that. Yeah. yeah, like that's that's not right for me. Um, like Keith said, the, the the French form stacks up well. I mean, she beat a, a bang in form via Sistina and above the curve last time, who were sort of proper Group Two, borderline Group One fillies. Uh, well, I think the via Sistina at the very least has won a Group One, um, and I can see that uphill finish really suiting her. Um, she's the sort of horse that sees her races out strongly. Even slight, you know, a slightly more truly run race than you'd generally get in France or Suter. So, uh, yeah, I'd be keen to take uh, take the four to one about her instead of even money in spiral for sure. Yeah, Marcus Savine four to one. Yeah, I really really like her on Saturday. We now move to Red Car for just the the sole race that we cover there. This sounds like it could be one for Matt. The two forty five. There is the William Hill two year old Trophy over six furlongs. Dragon leader, really short price here at four to six. Killian nine to two. Flanchianello is 13 to 2. Action Point is 14 to 1. Love Billy Boy is 20 to 1. 22 to 1. And bigger about the rest of them. Now, we spoke about that um, York Nursery handicap um, that was won by Zulu Chief. The third in that was Room Service, who actually went on to beat Dragon Leader after Dragon Leader being unbeaten. Matt looks so impressive, Dragon Leader, prior to that, but could just be just a, a little bit better than this lot. Yeah, he it, it, it's very reminiscent of that new market sales race that we talked about in the sense that on form there's there's very few in here that that hold much of a chance really. You know, Dragon Leader is four to six or whatever he is, and on form he's about the right sort of price. Um, he's coming back slightly in trip. He he didn't really see that six and a half furlongs out at Doncaster. I didn't think he's quite speedy. He travels pretty strongly. Um, yeah, he's going to be hard to beat. Um, if I was going to nominate a couple against him, then. I haven't totally given up on Killian yet. Um, he won that dragon. St- I saw that. I saw that face. So. <laughs> um, he won that dragon stakes, and he was really impressive at Sandown. Um, but there's been quite a few horses at Sandown this year. Two-year-old and older horses that have looked good there, and then been a bit sort of meh afterwards. Um, and he's well, he's been more than that. He's been pretty disappointing to be honest. But he's got the kind of like physical scope to think that he might still be a bit better. Um, I'll probably give up on him after this if he's disappointed again, but I, I'm prepared to give him another go. Um, and at a price, I thought Works of Art, who her debut form works out pretty well. She won next time, uh, and then she went to Chester and just found the emphasis on speed there too much. Um, I think this will suit her better. She might want seven furlongs in time, and she's got a heck of a lot to find on form, but she'll be a big price. Uh, but yeah, Dragon Lead is going to be going to be hard to beat. Okay, so two potentially take the uh, the favourite on with though Killian nine to two and works of art the Royal Runner at twenty two to one. Talk about horses that I've given up on Killian certainly one of them. I've always wanted to be with him, but I'd given up a few runs back, Matt. To be totally honest, um, Keith, for yourself, are you going to be taking on this favourite? You? Uh, I would struggle to be honest. I think this the the form stacks up even better than the favourite in the sales race. Uh, I guess I'm not going to get tucked in at four to six. I wasn't in love with that draw particularly. You, the the often things play out on the rail at Red Car and he's drawn pretty wide, but that's that's all I had <laughs> to try and get him beat. It's it's not a race I'll be playing. Okay, leaving that race alone, but we'll let Matt try and take on that favourite with Killian and Works of Art, and that's it for the main ITV action that we'll be covering, and plenty of strong fancies from the gents. And if you want some free bets to uh, to have a go on some of those fancies, then check this advert out. Do you want over five hundred pound in free bets? Well, the best free bet offers are now all in one place. Head to racingpost.com forward slash free bets where you can find all the offers from your favourite bookmakers. Click the link in the description to find out more. Welcome back to the final part of the Racing Postcast brought to you by Racing Post Members Club, Sam Hart, Keith Melrose and Matt Gardner guiding you through the weekend action. Now it's time to see if the gents have any other bets elsewhere this weekend or any other racing that we should be keeping an eye on. And Keith, we will start with you where we've got some interesting racing this weekend. We have. And, you know, it's, it's a bit of a... It's October and April are the two transitional seasons for me. I'm sort of tapering down the sprinters, but I'm building up the chasers slowly. We've got a bit of both on this weekend. Saturday, a couple of uh, races I'll probably bet in that aren't on the telly. The first one's a 4.45 at Ascot, and it's one of these one more chance ones. But I, I'm going to explain my, my reasoning here. I've been quite a fan of Harry Brown uh, for most of this season, but he had he finished ninth in the uh, the Holyrood House, but he shaped an awful lot better than that. He got pretty isolated and 
and went for him a little bit sooner than ideal. He just looked like a horse that was going to keep going on at that day. And there was a couple of excuses since he ran in the Be Friendly at Haydock last time. He got wiped out at the start. So I'm not so worried about that. He's got Haley Turner up, who who rides Ascot pretty well. He's getting one more chance in a 4.45, which isn't as strong a race as he's been running in, to be quite honest. You know, it's not a Holyrood house. It's not a Be Friendly. That was a dead good race, that. So I'll be going for uh, for Harry by one more chance in that. I'll be having a bet at Wolverhampton. Might be my first bet at Wolverhampton of the year, actually. Uh, there's a 7.30 on Saturday. Uh, and the horse I'm going to back isn't 100% decided yet. It's likely to be Sporting Hero, who looked quite promising and then had a break after a run on in May, got gelded, and they brought him back for the Racing League. Now, George Boy knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing when he brings a horse back for the Racing League. And he was really tight in the betting that day. Uh, I thought he... He did pretty well to come with from where he did. I thought he shaped as well as a first two in that race, and that would be pretty strong currency in a race like this. We've got Billy enough love main up, uh, but I'm also slightly interested in Battle Dubai. If we get a, a situation where Sporting Hero is very short and Battle Dubai has been forgotten about, I might back him because he's got a lot of good all weather form, and I thought he shaped well against a bias at Chelmsford last time. So that's the sort of view I'm taking on on the race at, uh, at Wolverhampton and then Sunday. Don't have decks for Sunday. We're recording this on Thursday, of course. But on Sunday we've got uh, Kelso, a really good meeting at Kelso that I often like to, to have a look at. When we've got, we're right in the uh, big jump off at the moment. It's going to be out in a couple of 20, weeks' time. Twenty third of October. Twenty third of October. Well, I'm currently writing the handicap chasers to follow, and that I get seven or eight to put in the paper. I've not Tom Parks. I've not got bloody infinite room. He says, so I've got seven or eight to get in there. The long list's about fifteen, and there's two horses running at Kelso, who are on the long list, but aren't going to make the short list of uh, seven or eight, you know, so the so the second tier horses to follow that I've got to look at at Kelso on Sunday if they're declared. First in the Simply Ned race, the, the big two mile one handicap chase there on the card, and I like the way that uh, Grand Voyage shaped in some of his later runs last season. He started the season really well, which is encouraging for this race last season, uh, winning at air and whatnot in a race that worked out pretty well. And then in the spring, there's a race on at Donny on Gold Cup Day where they shaped, I thought, best by miles against two horses in Dreaming Blue, who ran well next time, and, and St. Doctor, who I think won his next two. And then he ran at Carlisle uh, and finished running into Return Ticket, who got a better uh, run through the race. He beat the rest fairly handily, uh, having come from quite an unpromising position, and Return Ticket finished a close-up fourth at the Scottish National Meeting next time and won at Cartvale the time after that. So sort of ran into one a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I thought he'd be interesting if he was declared for that Kelso race and then we've got a later race, 4.30 at Kelso how about this for a horse that got unlucky last season, we've got a horse called Half Shot now I think he's half a dog to be honest, he doesn't really, he puts his head very high I don't like that, it's one of the things I don't like but last year he had three seconds on his profile second to not long till me at Musselburgh, who went on to finish second in the Turners, second to Bill Baxter at Kelso, who went on to win the top him. and then he finished second to Elvis Mail, who loves it around Kelso and, is, and, and was in form all last season. Finished the season with a seventh in the Scottish National, where he didn't stay, but he did pretty well. He went through the race and travelled through the race. He just cut out when, when push came to shove, and, you know, forgivable. The horse had only run uh, over beyond three miles a couple of times for his life before that, and he turns up in his three-mile two race at Kelso on Sunday the 4.30. Ian Jordan's got Craig Nickel up. It could be quite a warm race for a not to 120 uh, if they all turn up. I think he's more likely to turn up than most. Jordan has booked Craig Nickel at this point already, but even if it is as strong as it could be, it's not as strong as a Scottish national. It's not as strong as finishing up, running up against Lot Long to me, and it's not as strong as taking on Bill Baxter. So I thought Half Shot was really interested in the 4.30 at Kelso. And then finally on Sunday, if you're looking for something to watch, I won't be betting in the race, but you've got uh, the Velka Pardi Vika running, it, uh, running over in the Czech Republic, or Czechia. Um, we've got some British and Irish interest. You know, you've got uh, Sean O'Keefe Sova and James Best, and Patrick Mullins has got himself on last year's winner. Uh, and obviously Jan Faltacek, he's still riding over there. He's got a ride in the race, but uh, I never bet in it. But it's always it's always a pretty unique spectacle that race. So if you're sitting around at a loose end on Sunday afternoon at three o'clock, stick that on. Yeah, it is it's a fascinating race. The, the three o'clock there at Barbadici in uh, the, the Czech Republic worth watching if you haven't seen it before. And a few selections there from Keith for the weekend. Matt, is there anything else that you've looked at this weekend? Uh, yeah, well, I'd say, for, to start with, I'd second Keith Harry Brown shout. I think he, he's just a well handicapped sprinter that I've been waiting to sort of win a semi decent race this this year, and this could be this could be his day. I think 
Um, over in Ireland, there's a, a sort of interesting two-year-old filly called Kitty Rose running in a in a Group Three at the Curra, uh, one forty-five, I think it is. You know, she only she only costs twenty grand, and she's nothing sort of flash on paper, um, but she's just like properly professional so far. She beat a couple of subsequent winners on debut. She won a listed race last time, beating a O'Brien horse who I think reposes content. Um, you look at her and you kind of think, oh, she's an early two-year-old and and all that, but she's got a bit of bit about her physically she didn't make a debut until the end of august and if she was in a in a bigger yard there'd be a lot more buzz about her and um, i'm not saying she's going to go on to be like a, a, a proper group really sort of next year but um i i just think there'd be a, a lot more interest in her if she was with different connections so um yeah just a, a an interesting two-year-old to keep an eye on yeah kitty rose that's in the 145 at the car for the trainer miss natalia lupini who is certainly on the rise. She, um, she's got some nice horses at the moment. And, yeah, she, she could be in for a big season next season. Keep an eye out for her. Right, time for the best bets of the week. And then uh, let's see how we get on this week. A fair play to Graham Robway last week's 8-1 about Sea Silk Road over in France. So, um, yeah, a good spot from him there. Matt, you can go first. Who's going to be the best bet for you this weekend? Uh, this was tight. I did like Dark Trooper in that Ben Goff, but I, I really fancy Orban in the Challenge Cup. Um, sticking one, one up in a big field handicap at Ascot might be foolish, but um, yeah, the, the the profile really sticks out for me. There you go, 20 to 1, Orban in the Challenge Cup at Ascot. Key for you? Well, allow me to take Dark Trooper and make sure he's on the, the nap, Trixie. So it's Dark Trooper for me in the 3 o'clock, the Ben Goff stakes. Dark Trooper for Keith in the Ben Goff Stakes and then another one that we'll all be quite happy with I'm going to be napping up and I always would be is the French Raider in the Sun Chariot rates. Uh, Marcus de Savine I now know the full name thank you to Keith Melrose I um, think this horse is just on a massive rise like I say Pouchan gets along with this horse so well really impressed by the run in the, the, uh, the Rothschild and then on to the Romanet I just think this horse against Inspiral, who could be vulnerable, like the gentleman has said. I think 4-1 to one might be a fair enough price about the French Raider. And there we go. That is our selections, our nap selections for this weekend. Hopefully they all go well. Um, before we leave, everyone, what are the plans for this weekend? Like you say, it's not the best quality weekend of racing, but still might be worth sitting down and watching plenty of it. Keith, what are you up to this weekend? Uh, I've got kids. Uh, it's October, so loads of kids' birthday parties because everybody's popping out kids in September and October. Did you know that? No, I didn't, I didn't know. know I didn't know that was a popular kid. month. I didn't. Well, I think it's either people are bored in January or September babies do the best. I don't know. It's one of the two. But anyway, lots of kids' birthday parties. So I'll be going to all that and watching Dark Trooper hopefully win a bingo off on my phone. Well, hopefully so. Uh, Matt, what are your plans this weekend? Yeah, a bit of racing Saturday. Hopefully, watch that treble win. I quite, I quite like the sound of that. Um, I think the weather's supposed to be quite nice, isn't it? So I might get, might get out on the golf course. Yeah, I might be doing that. There we go. There, that's good enough. I'm going to be. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I mean, people will know I'm actually staying at Paul Keeley's house, looking after a parrot at the moment. Um, yeah, no, it's an interesting one. How is the parrot getting on? Is yeah, no, abs- to... absolutely flying. He, he gets an hour flight per day, if not a little bit more. Flies around the living room, scares you. Take him out for the fly. No, I'm, honestly, I've had to shut all the windows and make sure that nothing goes wrong. But, yeah, no, he's, he's doing all right. Kills is back in, a, I think, a week's time. So um, as soon as he's back, um, yeah, he can look after the parrot and I can head back home to the, the south coast. So, yeah, no, all is well. So, yeah, fun old weekend for all of us by the sound of things. And that's it for this week's Racing Postcast. Thanks, as always, to everyone watching on YouTube. Thanks to everyone listening to us on all audio platforms. If you haven't already, like, share, subscribe. Get your comments in down below with your best bets and we'll be back again next weekend for future champions weekend cheers for watching